welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. And of course, joining us from Sydney, Australia, our special guest author is Dr. Robert Haddad, PhD. His new book, Always Be Prepared, a new apologetics course for Catholic secondary students published by Perugia Media, coming to us from our Perugia Media EWTN studios in Sydney. It's great to be with you. Well, it's an honor to be here today as well. Thanks very much. Oh, it's our it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. So, in in putting this book together, Doctor, uh, it's like a course book basically on apologetics, and you talk about the idea of focusing on apologetics and renewed focus. Why do we need a renewed focus? Why did it ever go away? Well, we do need a renewed focus, and um, my primary concern is to see Catholic apologetics restored in formal educational circles. Why did it go away? That's the great mystery. It shouldn't have gone away. Most people would say that post-Second Vatican Council, apologetics in the life of the church diminished somewhat. There's no reason to attribute that to the Second mm -hmm. Vatican Council. There are multiple references in the Council calling for apologetics, and the one that springs to mind uh, most clearly is uh, paragraph 6 in the in the, in the decree on the apostle of the laity, which was issued near the end of the council in 1965, called upon the laity to be very active, to live out their baptism and confirmation in defending the Catholic faith and Catholic truths in society. So why apologetics diminished in, in general and in, in Catholic educational circles mm -hmm. in particular is a mystery, shouldn't have right. occurred. And, and you know, my endeavor in Catholic education is to what, do whatever I can to see it somehow restored. Right, you say here, uh, from the 60s onwards, interest in apologetics declined significantly. Uh, and part of it was, you talking about in the book, the introduction, the forward about it becoming unfashionable to some degree, I guess, kind of the idea of it being offensive, uh, you know, your truth is as good as mine, one that we hear a lot of today. Uh, but you talk about the fact that Pope St. John Paul II would provide the Magna Carta uh, of the new apologetics. We need a new apologetic geared to the needs of today, which keeps in mind that our task is not just to win arguments, but to win souls. So that is always interesting, which we talk about the new apologetics. Is it just a, a nicer, kinder apologetics, or is there something different in what, how we're doing it or in what we're coming up against as far as the arguments against the faith? Well, it's probably all, all those in some form of combination. New apologetics, I've come to realize, is basically uh, a restoration of the original injunction of St. Peter that we read in 1 Peter 3.15, which is to always be ready to provide, to give a defense for the hope that's within us, but to do it with mm -hmm. gentleness and reverence. And the gentleness and reverence, I think, is what St. John Paul II is focusing on when it comes to the new apologetics, how always to be concerned about the other as a person and their concerns and to win their soul rather than to win the argument. So there's that aspect mm -hmm. to the new apologetics. But what you said in your question, the other dimension is that, yes, we are needing, we need to meet new challenges that are arising and still arising in the modern world today. Mm -hmm. I would think also in one way, in the old days, the apologetics was kind of going outward, you know, in dealing with, you know, outward uh, Protestantism or things like that, and, and atheism, and obviously you talk about the new atheism and the, the focus on that and what young people are dealing with. But it's also really is an apologetic for Catholics who need, in a sense, to be re-evangelized in their own faith, right? Oh, well, absolutely. Uh, where, where I operate, I find that a, a lot of Catholics are, are, are very nominal. They call themselves Catholics. They might have a certain level of practice, but there's certainly, they don't have the f foundational underpinnings for their beliefs. Um, and so it's, that's correct. We need to be giving those foundational underpinnings to our mm -hmm. own people. 
uh, as to why we believe what we do and why we practice what we practice. So there's a lot of, in, as you said, internal apologetics, which is necessary to conduct these days. And that's one reason why we need apologetics back into Catholic institutions, uh, mm -hmm. senior Catholic secondary schools, uh, and of course in our universities and in our seminaries. And of mm -hmm. course, there's an ever-growing need to deal with the apologetics outside of the church as well. Right. I'm wondering, since uh, we're talking to you and this is kind of focused, as you said, on secondary schools, what would be a secondary school in, in Australia? Is that similar to a high school in the United States? Yes. Is, you know, like uh, 14, 15 to 18 kind of range or is it different? Because I know well, sometimes yes. in England we can get confused by when they talk about their various schools. Yeah, well, most secondary schools in Australia are high schools, and they basically start with year seven and end with year 12. And so you come into year seven, roughly 11 turning to 12, and you okay. leave year 12, 17 turning 18. This particular uh, course is aimed at the upper level, students who are 15, 16, and 17 years of age. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you lay out this thing as a, in, in units, with unit objectives, and uh, for teacher to use, is it just for a school format? Is this also something that can be used by a parish or what? I think it can be used by anyone in any circumstance. Of course, it's rigidly designed because the, 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 the requirements upon me was to create a formal course. So I had to have it that's mm -hmm. so structured and I had to have time limits on within each lesson, etc. So it, it is primarily constructed for use in a formal classroom setting. However, anyone can use it in any circumstances, any situations outside of the classroom, in a parish setting, in a homeschooling setting, etc. So you don't have to be a teacher, you don't have to be in a you don't have to be in a formal school setting. It, and you don't have to use the whole lesson. You can use certain parts of the lesson as you see fit. Now, you say in the beginning, uh, notice concerning the personal qualities of the quote-unquote new apologist. New apologetics requires a new type of Catholic apologist. You go and say, uh, therefore, should a Catholic new apologist, what should they actually look like? So what's different about these apologists today than they would have been 50 years ago? How do they look different? Well, well uh, apologetics say in its heyday in, in the 20th century, you know, from the 1930s to the 1950s, there was a touch of pugilism up in the sense that there, it was about winning arguments, and it still is about winning arguments. It's just a bit of a nuance where the qualities of a new apologist, they have to be... Um, of course, practicing their faith very well. They have to be very mm. prayerful. They have to be authentic. They have to have integrity. They have to know scripture. They have to know church teaching. Um, but they also have to be gentle in their approach. Friendship mm. is very necessary in the context of engaging the other. So it, we have to avoid any sense of haughtiness or any sense of superiority or arrogance mm -hmm. or triumphalism. We have to assert that we are Catholic and that we possess the fullness of truth, but we have to permeate that with humility and gentleness and, and respect right. of the other. So there's a balance there, because sometimes we made it, went the other way, where, like you said, it was pugilistic and it was winning an argument, to the other side, which is, I don't want anybody to feel bad, so I'm not going to press the point on what's actually the truth, you know, in a particular situation, because I, wa I want you to still like me, you say that the idea of speaking the truth in love and being a good humor towards all, you also highlight that the virtue really that's really important is, is charity there. Yeah, and I say that from not just from reading the textbooks and the authorities in this area, but I say it from my own experience. I've been in apologetical encounters, you know, roughly 35 years on and off, and I would say that the first 15 years were very fruitless. And one reason why is because I was very focused on winning arguments, and sometimes those arguments became heated. And you might mm -hmm. walk away thinking, hey, I've achieved something here, I've won the debate, I've won the argument. But no one ever came to conversion uh, in those encounters. And what happened 
you know, uh, when I began to work for the Archdiocese of Sydney and work in university chaplaincy and engage in apologetical encounters on university campuses, I was asked to be careful in my own approach. And when I began to have dialogue and conversation and form trust and friendships with other, with the other, that's when I think the Holy Spirit can work most effectively to bring about conversions. So we've got to avoid the extremes of saying, hey, I don't want to offend you. I don't. I, I, there is no truth. There is a truth mm -hmm. and we must present it and we must present it with that, you know, that, that charity and that respect of the mm -hmm. other. And I think in that context, uh, that's when the Holy Spirit can most effectively operate, as I say, I'll put it in those terms, with the other person. Right. You talk about humility as well, and especially I thought this was really good, because remember Carl Keating of Catholic Answers used to always say this, which was, you should always have the humility to say, I don't know, knowing that the Catholic Church does have an answer, even if you don't know it right now, uh, and to say, I don't know, but I'll get back to you with what it is. Well, that's certainly the case, because I don't think anyone knows it all. And uh, you're going to have to be prepared for the question that might be put you on the spot and you, you don't have the answer there and then. You shouldn't be putting up the white flag and saying, look, I, I don't have the answer, therefore the Catholic Church doesn't have the answer. I personally don't know, but guess what? I'm sure the Catholic Church has an answer. Give me a bit of time. Give me 24 to 48 hours. I'll do a bit of research on it. I'll get back to you and I'll give you the answer. If you, if you admit that you don't have the answer, you're showing mm -hmm. to the other that you have an honesty and integrity that I think they will respect. Mm -hmm. And, if you, and, and you, if you tell them, look, I will get back to you, you are showing them that you're giving your time to them and that you, you do believe there is a truth and you want to convey that mm -hmm. to them. Right, and also that you take what they have to say seriously, that you're not just necessarily just throwing things at them that you've uh, prefab in your mind, that you're actually reacting to their concerns and trying to react to the reasons why they may have an issue with what you're saying. You say the new apologist should always meet the doubters' needs with respect and diplomacy, not argumentative, combatic enemy who seeks only to critique and con condemn. New apologists as friends should still make hard truth claims, as we were just talking about, but should propose them rather than impose these truths with pastoral wisdom. Earlier you said new apologists ought always provide responses marked by clarity and fidelity. Now, it seems like recently in the church, one of the concerns a lot of people seem to have is that sometimes some of the teaching that's coming out recently uh, people find it hard to find that clarity. Well, that that is very sad indeed, and um, it, it concerns me as well. And of mm -hmm. course, I think that each and every one of us, if it, whether we're formally committed to education or not, we all have a responsibility to know the truth and to teach the truth in our own family situations, among our friends, among those we mm -hmm. encounter, and. Clarity is absolutely essential. And I just don't know how the church can be effective in its mission unless mm. it's always conveying its own teachings with clarity. And the, the, the two words rhyme, clarity and charity. That's what we need for ourselves and that's what we need to convey. Right. Sometimes we hear, you know, and certainly the Holy Father pros the idea of encounter and accompaniment, but it seems like to some degree, uh, that there's another stage there that people miss out on. Uh, as part of the accompaniment, you're trying to accompany that person to the truth, not continuing to go down whatever road they're already on, right? Well, absolutely. We don't accompany them along the way of error and confusion and, and poor lifestyles. If we accompany them, it's because we love them. We want to walk with them, but to walk with them where? To, to ultimately to conversion. That's conversion in belief and conversion in lifestyles. Otherwise, the accompaniment is of no value whatsoever. Right. And you also talk about the idea that it's important for an apologist to be enthusiastic and to be happy. Yeah, well, <laughs> as St. Teresa of Avila says, one of my most favorite saints, you know, God doesn't want sad saints. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, of course, if we believe that the Catholic faith the Catholic Church is the truth, or contains the fullness of the truth. Well, we have to show that. I mean, the truth is Christ's truth, and 
And Christ's truth is meant to make us happy. You know, he's, he came to give us life and life to the full. And of course, we live in a veil of tears and we have to always carry our crosses. But we have to show that it, that, that the Christ truth as contained in the Catholic Church does bring joy. And, and enthusiasm, or the, the root Greek word of, for enthusiasm, is filled with the Spirit of God. And, uh, and we, be, we have to be overflowing in that to the other. Okay. In the layout you, uh, of your lesson plan, and I'll just look at the introduction to apologetics, but you have kind of a quote that you start off with. This one was on Versati, but I thought it was interesting. You have activity sheets, which I wanted to reference too, because I thought they're very good. Uh, but you also had lesson outcomes. So in, in doing it as a teacher, uh, you're, you're evaluating yourself every day on, on how you're doing and, and the impact you're having on your students? Yeah, the lesson outcomes is to guide the teacher or the person who's presenting the lesson with what mm -hmm. the ultimate objectives are for each lesson. What do you want the students to uh, accomplish or to achieve? What are they meant to learn from that particular lesson? Mm -hmm. Now, in the handouts, the one that struck me initially was the first thing you're, the handout you gave for the first lesson was on the history of heresies. Why, why did you pick that? Well, because I think it's important to know history when it comes to apologetics and, and for the presenters and the students to know that history is a, uh, heresies are a common phenomenon today and they're more mm -hmm. prolific than ever in my opinion. But we've, we've, had, we've had to deal with heresies throughout the whole history of the church and therefore apologetics has been a necessary arm of theology since the church's very beginnings and it must continue so today as well. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end, you also have homework, so that's that's always threatening uh, for for all of us uh, former students there. Yeah. But I thought it was also interesting as resources. Some of the people, our, our audience would be very familiar with uh, Jimmy Aiken. Uh, you use some reference to him uh, from Catholic Answers, Mark Bremley for Ignatius Press, Avery Dulles, who was one of the great uh, cardinals, who, who who was one of the great humble men who was way, willing to come back and say, maybe I was mistaken. Uh, which a lot of others probably should have followed his lead, and also the one and only uh, Dr. Peter Kraft um, as, as resources. So in, in doing this particular uh, uh, lesson plan, one of them I thought was interesting was the Four Horsemen of the Anti-Apocalypse, which you have as one of your handouts. And uh, Dawkins, I know, and Sam Harris, I know, and, and Christopher Hitchens. The one I wasn't familiar with was, I think, Dennett. Who was Dennett? Yeah, well, Dennett, um, uh, to, be, to be very honest, he's probably of the four the least I know, but he's, he, he writes a lot of books concerning the human mind and the power mm -hmm. of the human person to be able to think and understand. And, of course, his ultimate end is to base all that in materialism. So there's a denial not only of God, but the denial of the human soul. And so when we argue in favor of God, we're arguing in favor of the ultimate, infinite, eternal spirit. But we must be also arguing that we have an eternal destiny and that that's because we have a spiritual soul. So we need mm -hmm. to counter those arguments like those put forward by Dennett and others that we don't have a human soul, that we are spiritual as well as material. Okay. Now, it's interesting, too, because Dawkins has uh, kind of uh, been... Uh a little more open to the possibility of God than becoming a little more agnostic than atheistic. And do you think when and you're dealing with people, when you talk about the new atheism, are most people who claim to be that really atheistic or are they more agnostic in your experience? Well, um, I, in my own personal experiences, I've encountered probably more people who claim to be atheists and agnostic. Um, mm. I think some of the younger people I might encounter wouldn't know really much of the difference between the two. Right. I'm concerned mm. about the rising uh, percentage of uh, people who affirm that they have no religion with each generation. With each generation since 1965, baby boomers, generations X, Y, Z, millennials, every generation is becoming 
a higher percentage of each generation is, a, is claiming to be no religion. That's very prevalent in Australia, and probably yeah. in the next five years, there'll be more yeah. people claiming to be no religion than there are people who claim to be Christian, Catholic and Christian. So that's a great concern for me. So right. we have to address those issues with atheism and new, new atheism, etc. Do some of the people who fall into that also just people who are generically into whatever spirituality, so they claim, well, I'm spiritual in some mystical way, but uh, it's ill-defined, and, and that's a kind of the extent of my spiritual life? Yeah, well, the people who claim to be spiritual and not religious would probably classify themselves in formal surveys as, as of no religion, because their spirituality mm. would not be dependent upon a being, and it, and like God, for example. Um, yeah. I would say that a lot of young people, the influences of social media today, which is so prevalent, they just they just somehow transition into no religion because they just want to conform with the general culture and the milieu that's around them, the predominating milieu and influences that they encounter. Right. Well, two of the two of the chapters you hit early on here, I think, uh, go right into the issue that a lot of younger people. Uh, run into, which is one, uh, the problem of evil and suffering, uh, which if they paid attention, they'd realize the Catholic Church is probably the only one who has a really good answer for that whole idea of evil and suffering. And the other five, uh, lesson five, is religion toxic and the cause of evil, because there's mm. a lot of misinformation out there that puts out as if all of these terrible things happen in the world are really a function of religious wars and things like that. And of course, we all know that, you know, communism, unless you want to call communism and fascism religions, which they, I guess they are in their own little way, were responsible for more people dying just in the 20th century than for all the mm. centuries that had anything to do with anybody else's religion. Well, um, I don't know if I've included this in the lesson itself, but only 7% of wars have a religious cause. The vast mm. majority of wars in human history are caused by uh, ideologies are caused by economic conflicts or, or imperialism or just uh, aggression in order to gain more power and conquest of other lands. So religion as a cause of wars is a very small cause of religion. But it's, a, it's the tactic of the new atheists in particular to talk about how religion is toxic, how God is a moral monster when we look at the Old Testament in particular, how religion is... Um, um, now we'd have, if there is a God who's infinite and eternal, then why is there evil in the world? And we have to show, give reasons for the existence of evil in the world as, as mm. due to the abuse of human freedom. And that God is not a dictator. He created us free. And that if we are to love, we can only love if we're free beings. But however, because we're free, we can abuse that freedom. And so the cause of evil in the world is not due to God, but mm -hmm. for the vast majority of reasons, due to humans abusing the good gifts that God has given us. Right. It's not in our stars, it's within ourselves, I think it, uh, yeah. Shakespeare said in Julius Caesar. Uh, the other thing you, you touch upon as well, and I know this from dealing with myself with Father Spitzer's show that we work on, the idea of com compatibility of faith and reason, which is I'm sure you have to hit dead on because that's the big issue where a lot of young people have believed that science has proven or any kind of reasonable understanding uh, precludes faith. Well, that's common out there as well today, but um, the, the one line that they use, that the atheists and new atheists use commonly is that religion is unreasonable and that if you are religious somehow you are not a person of reason or you're actually a, a stupid person for example but we have to show that they are compatible that all truths spiritual and natural truths emanate from the one source who is God and that there's no contradiction and we just we also have to put forward through history all those people who are very, who are very famous scientists who contributed to the human advancement and human knowledge, how many of them, the vast majority of them, who are very faithful, people of faith, people who believed in God, people who were theists, and people who were therefore very reasonable as, very, as well as being very faithful. Right. 
In the section uh, that had to do with uh, Protestantism, you talk about there are many Protestant objections against the Catholic belief in transubstantiation. If you examine a communion host under the microscope, all you see is molecules of bread. Also, if Catholic communion is about eating and drinking Christ's blood, then it's a form of cannibalism. I'm wondering how much of that is part of the apologetics people deal with anymore, because it seems like as bad a shape as the Catholic Church is in, the, most of the Protestant, at least the main lines, uh, pretty much have fallen apart. Uh, maybe it's dealing with the evangelicals. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Look, when we look, when I created this course, I had to look. I had to look at surveys about, about where students are, and there are very large surveys that we've conducted of, of up to eighteen thousand students every two years. Where are they up to with respect to their faith and practice? And we find that religious practice, particularly mass attendance, is is quite low. And with with, with mm -hmm. respect to our own students in our own schools, it's about twenty percent, and that drops to three to four percent within a couple of years after leaving school. So we had to have lessons there that fortify our what Catholics believe, what the Catholic Church believes with respect to the Mass and the Eucharist and the real presence in particular. Now there are still, and there are, there are strong strains of evangelical and Pentecostal movements here in Australia as there are of course in the United States and mm -hmm. they still win numbers of young people over to join them and when they join them they abandon belief in the Eucharist or the real presence, transubstantiation. So we do need to fortify people's faith, young people's faith with respect to the real presence. And of course what you're saying, arguments such as cannibalism, etc., um, they're probably, they're very ancient objections going back to the Roman Empire and they're probably not the common objections today, but I still think we need to address those objections because I still think that they come out of those more right. uh, virulent or more aggressive forms of Protestantism that's still operating today. Okay, very good. With that being said, we're out of time. Thank you so much, Dr. Robert Haddad, PhD. His book, Always Be Prepared, a new apologetics course for Catholic secondary students from Perugia Media. And you can check out uh, Dr. Haddad's uh, website as well. And this has been a special EWTN bookmark coming to you as we're talking to Dr. from Australia. Thank you for joining us here on EWTN's International Bookmark.